and to our gifted speaker, a boss, <laughs> Dr. Moore of NMJC, I am happy and honored to introduce to you Mr. Steve Saceda. Well, good morning, everyone. After an introduction like that, I think she was ready to preach. How about y'all? Uh, she, she was ready to go. I know Miss Evelyn did a wonderful job at the prayer breakfast, and it is a tremendous honor to be here. If you are still getting breakfast, hurry up. No, I'm just kidding. Just kidding. I want to say a big thank you to the committee for the opportunity. This is the 25 year anniversary of the Lee County Community Prayer Breakfast, and it is a huge honor to be the 25th anniversary speaker. When I got the call four months ago, I was at a speaking engagement in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and Brad Karras said, hey, we got your name down for speaker. You got five minutes. Are you in or out? I say, if you know Brad, the answer is always yes, sir. I was in there. So thank you so much. Thank you to USW for hosting this event. To all who attended, it is truly an honor for me to be here. This is coming home. For those of you that don't know, I am a proud graduate of University of the Southwest class of 2003 and also had an opportunity to work here for three years so it is a wonderful time for me to come home to Mustang Alley. So for the next few moments I've prepared a message that I believe could be impactful to you. You're going to see it on the screen if you want to follow along. If you'd like to take screenshots you go right ahead. If you want to post it that is perfectly fine with me. Feel free to tag me. I'm on Facebook, Instagram and LinkedIn and let's have a good time. By a show of hands, I gotta take this off. I cannot stand still, so I gotta move around a little bit. By a show of hands, who in here has heard me speak before? Would you raise your hand in some capacity? Thank you so much. If you've never heard me speak and this is your first time, would you raise your hand? Well, we're glad the sinners have come to get saved this morning. Don't know where you've been, but we are happy that you are here. So our title is here, is for such a time as this, taken from Esther 4.14. If you know the context of this story, you know that God uniquely placed Esther to make an impact in her life, in the lives of others, and in the lives of her nation. And the quote that the committee took out of this is, perhaps God has you here for such a time as this. That immediately tells us that God doesn't make mistakes that God is a God of timing and God is a God of purpose. And what we have to know about Esther is this woman had to have a whole lot of courage, courage in so many areas. So my first thing that I wanna put up here, I wanna ask you a question. And perhaps you're not used to some of the speakers asking questions, but here is my first question for you. In your opinion, what is the hardest thing in the world for people to ask for. If you have an answer, feel froggy and jump up and shout it out. What's the hardest thing for people to ask for? I'll wait. I heard help. Forgiveness. Forgiveness. What else? What is it hard for people to ask for? I heard help. I heard forgiveness. Money. That one's kind of hard. So there's been a poll done all over America in corporations and in churches, and in my travels all over the country, I ask this question, and I'm gonna put up here the number one thing that is so hard for people to ask for. Go ahead and put that next one up. Help. It is the number one thing that is so hard for people to ask for. Do you know why? Three words. Help requires humility. Help requires humility. It is swallowing our pride and going to a trusted friend, an advisor, a confidant, a counselor, a pastor, and going up to him and saying, hey, I'm not doing okay. Can we talk? Can we go get a cup of coffee? Can we share a meal together? I really need to talk to somebody. But if you ever take notice, especially in Lee County and in the Permian Basin, it just rolls off the tongue. Hey, how you doing? Good, how are you? It's just part of our colloquialism. But how many of you have actually ever stopped to listen to what someone might actually be going through? Because oftentimes it is so hard to admit 
that we don't have it all together. By a show of hands in here, how many of you had at least one social media account? Raise your hand up high. Wave them at me. Okay? Keep it up. Keep them up. Keep them up. It's early, but I know y'all can pay attention. How many of you have at least two social media accounts? Keep your hands up. How many at least three? Four? Five? Six? Anyone have seven? For those of you who have six, all the counselors in the room, I just got you some new clients in here, okay? Just kidding. But how many of you know on social media, all we do is put our highlight reels, not our behind the scenes? We want everyone to see how we're doing well. Hashtag blessed. Hashtag God is good. But I just beat my kids 47 times in the church parking lot before I walked up in here. Vulnerability takes courage. The courage it takes to reveal your heart is one of the most intimidating choices a person can make. To be seen as you actually are is more terrifying for people than a spider, than a snake, than heights, than an 80 mile an hour roller coaster. Because so often we let people meet our representative and keep everyone else at arm's length because to be seen as we actually are is almost a feeling of being naked. They're gonna see the real me. And here's one of the biggest fears that we have. But what if they don't like the real me? So I'm gonna paint it up real well and I'm gonna make sure that I always keep everyone at arm's length and let them meet my representative. And you see, vulnerability on social media is one thing, but real vulnerability is a face-to-face -face thing, where you're able to sit with someone trusted and they're able to pour into you while you are honest and transparent with them. Next statement, vulnerability sounds like truth and feels like courage. Truth and courage aren't always comfortable, but they are never weakness. You see, oftentimes we raise our young men to say, we say things like this, hey, just buck up and be a man. Handle it. We tell our young ladies, oh, just put your big girl pants and buck up and put some mascara on. So what we are teaching young people is never to deal with what's going on, but to shove it down and suppress it. And then it comes out in unhealthy ways as adults. Or we post it to social media looking for validation and looking for likes, but still feeling empty on the inside. How many of you recall, this is so crazy, in March will be four years since the pandemic started. Some of you lost people, some of you lost friends, some of you lost family members. But one of the things that skyrocketed during the pandemic was suicide. Do you know why that statistic skyrocketed? Because humans were never designed to live isolated. We were designed for community. You might say, Steve, but I'm an introvert. I don't like being around people. An introvert and isolation is two very different things. An introvert is a personality type. Isolation is a choice. And see, when you start isolating yourself, there's only one voice that you're hearing in isolation. And which voice is that? Yours. And 99% of the time, that voice is lying to you. So most people associate the idea of vulnerability with weakness. If they see a male crying, they're like, wuss. Or if someone's sharing their heart, they're like, they need to keep that to themselves. They want to avoid being vulnerable in any capacity, listen to this, so they're not taken advantage of or hurt. The need to protect yourself feels logical. If you put up walls, then no one can hurt you. But that also means that no one can connect with you. You put those walls up, you put a barrier here, you put a bubble around yourself and say, I'll let you close, but not too far. Because to be seen as you really are takes the highest amount of courage. And I wanna show you something from the Word of God in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, 
verses 9 and 10. This is out of the message translation. This is Paul writing to the church at Corinth. He said, my grace is enough. It's all you need. My strength comes into its own in your, what does that next word say? In your weakness. There's one. Once I heard that, I was glad to let it happen. I quit focusing on the handicap and began appreciating the gift. It was a case of Christ's strength moving in on my what? Weakness. Now I take limitations in stride, and with good cheer, these limitations that cut me down to size, abuse, accidents, opposition, bad breaks, I just let Christ take over, and so the weaker I get, the stronger I become. So when I read this passage in context in the Word of God, perhaps you prayed and you say, God, I just don't feel like I have any strength. I feel like I don't have the strength to carry on. And can I submit to you for consideration that perhaps you're devoid of strength because you're using all your strength to put up a facade instead of having the courage to deal with it head on. I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. But on the inside, you're dying. The first step, friends, in dealing with our weaknesses is that we have to stop denying them. Denying weakness is not going to solve it. And a statement for you here, you're not going to see it on the screen, that although we do all struggle, the people who struggle the most are the people who struggle alone. The people who pretend that everything is fine. In church circles, you hear this statement a lot. Steve, I'm just going to fake it till I make it. Oftentimes they spiritualize it and they'll say, I'm just going to faith it till I make it. Can I tell you something with all the love in my heart? Fake it until you make it only works until the faking breaks you. You can only hold the facade for so long. I'm just going to fake it till I make it. And then what happens when that faking it breaks you and you're seen for who you really are? I want to tell you a true story. I'm going to step down the stage. Louise, hopefully, doesn't mess up the camera, doesn't mess up your sound a little bit. Oh, this feels more natural. Three and a half years ago, I was in the grocery store, Albertsons, here in HobbsAmerica.com. It was a time during the pandemic. There were arrows everywhere. There were masks here. There were masks there. There were people fighting. There were people losing their relationships over this stuff, and people were flat out afraid. So there I was with my little cart, with nothing but healthy organic food like cookies and ice cream because, hey, we were all feeling kind of crazed at that time. And I had all kinds of stuff in my cart. And I'm walking along in the frozen food section because I'm looking for ice cream, Talenti's mint chocolate chip. Know that. You want to get me something? Merry Christmas to you, Steve. That's what I was looking for. And I recognized the gentleman by his eyes. I said, hey, man, how you doing? And he pulled his masks down. And he looked at me like this. Everyone looking up here at my Asian face? Steve, what's a Asian? A Mexican who could pass for Asian. Right here. I know it's early. He said, Steve, I am fantastic. I am doing outstanding. I pulled my little cart over of organic, healthy food. Pulled my mask down. I said, brother, what's the secret? He said, what are you talking about? I said, we've been all losing our minds for the last eight months. What are you doing? to make you fantastic and outstanding. I said, I'll pay you. Apple Cash, Apple Pay, Venmo, PayPal, I don't care what is it, we'll do a counseling session right here. And I was more than willing to pay him for the secret. His eyes welled up with tears. He said, Steve, I'm not doing okay. I'm not outstanding. I'm not fantastic. He said, my job is going through another round of cuts and I'm pretty sure I'm gonna be laid off next week. My wife and I fight all the time, and my marriage is on the brink. My kids are struggling like crazy with online school. I don't know if they're going to pass. And for the next 20 minutes, I did nothing but listen. I let him vent. I let him share his heart. And for God's sakes, I let a grown man cry all he wanted in the frozen food section at Albertson's Market in Hobbs, New Mexico. I didn't give him a Christian cliche that God has a plan or just 
Hang in there, buddy. It's going to be okay. All I did was listen. And at the end of the 20 minutes, I put my hand on his shoulder, and I said, I want to ask you a question again, my friend. I said, how you doing? He said, I'm not okay, but I believe I will be. I said, doesn't that feel better than, oh, I'm good, how are you? I'm outstanding, I'm fantastic. And then here's the kicker, Stu. He said, it does, but no one ever stops to care or to listen. We're all so busy. We're all running through ourselves, myself included. But there is something courageous about stopping and asking a question and asking, how are you? But not just asking the question, stopping and listening. Now, I want you to do something for me. If you got two hands free, I want you to put your forks down, put your, put your drinks down for just a moment. If you got two ears and two hands, I want you to grab your ears just like this. Andy, just like this. Hang on to them there. We're taking pictures of you. Just kidding. <laughs> now, I want you to put your hand over how many mouths you have. If you, got, if you got a hand, go ahead and put it over your mouth. You can let go of your ears. Way to pay attention. If you know math in here, you know the ratio. It's called two to one. So by design, by God's design, you were given two ears and one mouth. Do you know what that tells you and I? We were designed by God to listen twice as much as we speak. But how many know we get that twisted all the time? When someone tells us a problem within two seconds, we're like, I got it. I got the solution. But most of the time, they're not looking for a solution. Do you know what they're looking for? Listen. Can you be compassionate? Can you hear what I'm trying to say? And I am proud to say I followed up with that buddy. He did not get fired. He and his wife are still together, and his children passed. Praise God for that. Yeah, we can give that a round of applause. So when we expose the weakness... Something tries to come in called shame. And listen to this. Shame says it's better to look all right than to be all right. Shame says you value your image over your emotional and your spiritual health. That's what shame says. Because if they see me as I really am, they're not going to want anything to do with me. Next statement. In admitting that you don't feel strong, you show true strength. In being openly vulnerable, you show true courage. And the truth in weakness is this. If you own it, you surpass it. But if you hide it, it owns you. You know what shame is like? It's like a mushroom. You know how mushrooms grow? It grows in dark, damp places. The enemy would love nothing more than for you to stay in that dark, damp place because it prevents you from fulfilling your God-given purpose. And so he wants you to hide. One of my favorite statements is up on the screen now. We might impress people with our strengths, but we connect with people through our weaknesses. Story time again. You know why this is so passionate for me? I was born October 13th, 1981. Just had a birthday last month, turned 42 years old. You might say, Steve, man, you don't look that old. You're my new best friend. You might say that gray hair makes you look old. We ain't friends no more, okay? But there's something that I did for 36 years of my life, and it was the guy in the grocery store. How you doing? I'm great. I'm fantastic. Man, I'm doing God is good. And then the other side, if I say God is good, you've been in church a long time. What do you say? All the time, and then you say it back, and all the time, and on the inside, you're like, I'm going to beat that man in just a minute because I got this rage on the inside. And we're walking volcanoes. Steve, what's a walking volcano? At any moment, you've suppressed so much, and you go to the Wendy's drive through and you'd be like, yeah, can I uh, get a chocolate frosty? And they said, uh, sorry, our machine's broken, and you lose it on this young lady making minimum wage. And it didn't really have anything to do with the frosty. It had everything to do that had been suppressed. 
in 2016, up to that point in my life, I had the greatest professional year of my life up to that point. Firing on all cylinders. And in 2017, my world came apart. And for the next 18 months, battled a deep and dark depression that I didn't want to get out of bed. I didn't want to go to work. I didn't want to be around people. If you've ever dealt with depression, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Broke down everywhere. I'd be at Starbucks ordering my favorite drink, ice cream, tea, lemonade, sweetened, hint, hint, ice cream, tea, lemonade, sweetened, hint, okay? Ordering my favorite drink, break down. Putting gas in my car, break down. Couldn't pull it together for the life of me. My boss at the time, I went to his office. It was after Labor Day weekend, 2017. I went into his office and I pulled the chair and I'm crying. I said, I need you to do something for me, boss. He said, what's that? I said, I need you to fire me. He said, why would I do that? And with tears running down my face, I said, because I can't get it together. And you deserve someone here in this seat who can do this job. And I'm not doing it justice. And he looked at me with love in his eyes and he said, Steve, I'm not going to fire you. I know you're struggling. But then he said the thing that made all the difference in the world. But I'm with you. I'm with you until the end with this. And there are people in this room who were instrumental in me getting through that valley. Steve, what does this have to do with courage? Everything. Because we do not get out of the pit by ourselves. There is something that my pastor Ty Bean tells me all the time and has taught us for years. When you're struggling, you reach out and then you reach up. You don't fight this alone. And my friends, this is not a motivational speech of pulling yourself up by the bootstraps and believing in yourself and the power of your inner self. There is one reason that I got out of the pit and one reason alone, and his name is Jesus Christ. And he worked through people. He worked through people. My father is here. My pastors are here. I've got friends all over this place. And some of them were instrumental in me coming out of that. But do you know the biggest thing that got me in that pit? This. I'm good. Praise God, I'm good. I'm a Christian. I don't struggle with those things. Hey, listen. If you're breathing and walking this earth, you are a prime suspect for dealing with those things. But I hope I can bring some freedom to someone today and say, if you deal with worry, if you deal with anxiety, if you deal with depression, or you deal with dark thoughts, it doesn't make you any less of a Christian, and it doesn't mean that you love God any less. It just means you got to reach out and reach up and get some help and don't do this by yourself. There's so many people whose lives end prematurely because they're always by themselves and alone with their thoughts. So friends, your hope is not in recognizing how bad you are or how good you are. Your hope is recognizing Jesus' infinite grace and goodness. It's about His grace and His goodness, not how good you are. Not what church you go to, not how much you volunteer, if you're a deacon or an elder, and all those things are wonderful. But the only thing that works is recognizing his infinite grace and his mercy. By a show of hands in here, has anyone ever messed up in life? Would you raise your hand for me? If your hand ain't up, you lie about other things. Don't trust them. Look around you. If you've messed up, raise your hand. This takes courage. You can put your hands down. We got you on video, okay? Don't beat yourself up so much that you can't receive the, the grace that God gave you to change. Steve, but I, I messed up. You don't know what I did. You don't know where I've been. You don't know what I said. But he does, and he knows the worst about you, but believes the best about you. That's what I love about our gracious God. How many of you had strict parents? Growing up, would you be willing to raise your hand? Everyone's looking around making sure their parent ain't up in here. Oftentimes, we would mess up and, you know, most of us grew up in a time where spanking was a thing without the police being called, where you actually had to go out into 
the yard to go get a stick off the tree. Like, you had to go get your own weapon and engage in Mortal Kombat when you were like eight years old. And there would be beatings there, there would be spankings. But I believe oftentimes that mentality translates to our walk of faith, where we mess up and we think, God's going to get me. God's going to do something to me. But let me tell you this, it's not on the screen. Religion says God will love you if. But the gospel says God will love you even if. Religion says, I messed up, my dad is going to kill me. But the gospel says, I messed up, I need to call my dad. Rather than running from the father, grace says, I messed up. And not only saying this to an ever-loving God, but courage is also having the ability to go to someone that we have wronged and say, I messed up. Will you forgive me? I'm so sorry. Instead of getting on Pinterest and finding a motivational quote for your Facebook to try to prove how you were right. Instead of just going to someone and saying, Stu, my bad brother. I'm so sorry. Do you know how often people will receive that? 99.9% .9 of the time. To just say, I'm sorry. And that takes courage. As we begin to land this plane, forgiving yourself is as important as forgiving others. Do you know why? Guilt is toxic. Many of us have a wonderful opportunity to forgive others and we can do it. But then when you look at the person in the mirror, it becomes a lot harder. Next verse I want to read to you is Romans chapter 2 verse 4. God has been kind to you. He has been very patient, waiting for you to change. But you think nothing of his kindness. Maybe you don't understand that God is kind to you so that you will decide to change your lives. The New Living Translation says it this way. Don't you see how wonderfully kind, tolerant, and patient God is with you? Does this mean nothing to you? Can't you see that his kindness is intended to turn you from your sin. You might know this verse like this. It is the kindness of God that leads people to repentance. Let me say this again. It is the kindness of God that leads people to repentance. Oh, in the back, you want me to say it again? It is the kindness of God that leads people to repentance. Steve, what are you trying to say? I'm trying to say that it is the kindness of God that leads people to repentance. You know, one of my favorite sayings is this. No one cares how much you know until they know how much you care. You may be able to quote the Bible from Genesis 1 all the way to Revelation. But if you're ugly to the coffee barista, they don't want to hear about your Jesus. It takes courage to love people where they are. Because God found us where we were and loved us as we are, but didn't leave us there. He gave us an opportunity to change. I had a friend who owned a restaurant here in town many, many years ago. He was of a different faith, but we would always have conversations, Miss Pat. And one time we were talking, he said, Steve, he said, you people get on my nerves. At first I was like, whoa, you people, where are we going with this, buddy? We talking short guys, little guys, Hispanic guys, Christian guys, sarcastic guys. What are we talking about? Who are you people? He said, Christians. I said, why? He said, they flood my restaurant on Sunday, Stu, and they demand the highest service, and they tip the worst. He said, but they'll leave me a track telling me about their Jesus, but they gave my server a dollar. It is the kindness of God that leads people to repentance, Sarah. How many of you know someone like this? Don't raise your hand if it's you. Steve, I'm just brutally honest. I just tell it like it is. And if they don't like it, they can grow up. And most of the time, the people who say things like that focus on the brutal instead of the honesty. Next statement up here for me. We can speak truth while also showing grace. Grace without truth is meaningless. Truth without grace is mean. 
But grace and truth together is medicine. John 1.14 says Jesus came full of grace and truth. The truth camp is always telling you what you did wrong. The grace camp says, man, you can do whatever you want because God's grace covers a multitude of sin. But Jesus lives in both camps. My grace does cover it, but my grace also gives you the power to change. If you've ever wanted to witness to somebody, the best way to do that, show them kindness. Show them love. Don't be judgmental about what they're doing or what they're not doing. They know that already. One of the things Pastor Ty tells us all the time is there's nothing like breaking bread to get to know somebody. Well, Steve, they're sinners. Well, last time I checked, so were all of us saved by grace. How many of you remember the guy named Zacchaeus from Luke chapter 19? He was the chief tax collector. To put it nicely, he was the IRS in midget form. No one liked him. He was a thief. He stole from people. And he heard the man, Jesus, was coming to town. So he said, I got I to get in on this. I got to see this act. But the Bible says he was so short, he couldn't see over. So what did he do? He ran ahead. Now, don't, don't shoot me for this. I know sometimes we can be traditional. So get an image of Zacchaeus up in a tree. And here comes the creator of all things. Did he ignore him? Did he know what he was all about? Of course he did. What did he do? He didn't whisper anything to him. He yelled it. Zacchaeus! Everyone turned. They're like, oh my God, is he here to take more tact from us again? Thought we were here to get healed. This guy's trying to steal from us. He said, Zacchaeus, I need to come to your house and have lunch with you today. In front of everybody. And Zacchaeus came down. Brought him into his home. And if you read the rest of Luke 19. In the next few verses Stu. He starts calling him Lord. And he says I will repay. Everything I've stolen. Four times. So in other words he said if I took a quarter from you. I'll give a dollar back to you. What changed him? The kindness of of God led him to repentance. One moment with Jesus and one moment of kindness. As I begin to land, I want to say something here. It's important to not become a homeowner and start talking down to renters. It's important to not get married and start talking down to single people. It's important to not make some decent money and start talking down to those still trying to make ends meet. It's important to not form a small LLC and start talking down to those who punch a clock. It's important to not get a promotion and start talking down to colleagues like they're inferior. And for us, it's important for us to not accept grace and forgiveness and start talking down to those who are doing what you used to do. Humility is still the code, and remember what you were saved from. As the old country preacher used to say, don't look down your bony nose and pointing your bony finger at me, because you used to be right here with me, Skippy. But it's important that we don't develop spiritual amnesia. Steve, what is that? Forgetting that at one point you were lost and separated from God and in need of grace and mercy. We didn't come out of the womb saved. The only reason we got saved is because the Holy Spirit drew us. A couple questions as we land this plane. We got five minutes left. If they're sitting at your table, this doesn't have to apply to you. But how many of you have ever worked with someone that's less than unpleasant? If your hand ain't up, I know they're at your table or across the gym from you. They'll love you and forgive you. Why? Because it's the kindness of God that leads people to repentance. Next statement I want to put up there. People are often the most unlovable when they need love the most. 
People are often the most unlovable when they need love the most. No matter how annoying people may be, we were designed for community. Isolation is unnatural and goes against our design. Isolation is the worst possible counselor, and 99% of the time that voice is lying. And I want to show you two verses as we close. Proverbs chapter 18, verse 1 says, He who willfully separates himself from God and man seeks his own desire, and he quarrels against all sound wisdom. Ecclesiastes 4, 9, and 10 says, Two people are better than one, for they can help each other succeed. If one person falls, the other can reach out and help. But someone who falls alone is in real trouble. Pretending you've got it all together is easy, but it's empty. Admitting you don't is frightening, but can also be extremely fulfilling. Friendship is one of the greatest gifts that God has ever given to us. And I've got some very, very dear friends in this room, and I'm so honored that you would come out to support and hear this message. And friends, while we may not get to choose what we go through in life, we do get to choose who we go through it with. You may not always get to choose what, but you do get to choose who. And my final statement on the screen for you, the danger of isolation is much greater than the risk of vulnerability. So you've got a choice this morning. You can take this with a grain of salt and just be like, oh, he was kind of funny, kind of entertaining. I only looked at my phone for 20% of the time. Maybe it was a good breakfast. Maybe you didn't like some of it. Or you can take the truth from God's word and take what has applied to you. And if you have been isolated or lonely, don't let the enemy win that battle and get you some community. It's going to take vulnerability. It's going to take transparency. To go to someone privately and say, can we talk? I'm not doing okay. Well, Steve, I tried that with someone and, and it didn't work. I've heard that before. How many of you in here ever gone out to eat and had bad service before? Again, if your hand ain't up, you lie. Sure you have. Did you stop going out to eat? No, you didn't. You probably tried a different restaurant, but you didn't stop going out to eat. You ever had a bad exp experience in a movie theater? Popcorn was cold. They were out of peanut M&Ms. Oh, shut that place down. Your feet stuck to the floor, but you didn't stop going to movies. So just if you tried it with someone and it didn't work, don't give up. Don't give up if that first person you didn't make a connection with. We were designed for community. And what I want to say is this, folks. I believe in counseling. I am a Christian, and I believe in counseling. I believe in therapy. If you need some kind of support group, you get you one. I believe in pastors. I believe in friends. I believe in accountability. But don't forget the primary one who can actually do something to change your life. And his name is Jesus. His name is Jesus. There is a reason that the Bible says that he is given the name that is above every name. And what I like to think about is that, is there's times that people will say, Steve, I, if I ignore it, it's just not there. Out of sight, out of mind. Sarah, you know why I like applying names to that? Because if I can apply a name to it, depression, worry, anxiety, financial strain, if I put a name to it, the Bible tells me that his name is above every name. So have the courage to name it and put it under the feet of Jesus. Lee County, thank you very much. I love you. Thanks for the opportunity.